Welcome to the Wine Math series. My name is Maureen Maroney, and in this video, we'll be going through some calculations for representative vineyard sampling. If you would like to skip the detailed explanation and head straight to an example, you can use the timestamps in the video description below. Let's get started. When you collect vineyard samples, you want what you have collected to accurately reflect the area of the vineyard that you collected it from. This requires what we call representative sampling. There are a few different ways to do this, but the main things to keep in mind are how much variation there is between the grapes, clusters, or vines in the area that you're sampling, and what parts of the vineyard will eventually end up getting picked and fermented together. Let's say that you have a vineyard block with very little variation. It's all the same elevation. It's all the same soil type. All the vines are the same age. They're all in the same training system and so on. In this case, if we take a well-distributed, fairly quote unquote blind sample, we should be able to capture that variation, that limited amount of variation pretty easily. But what if your vineyard block looks more like this in terms of changes in elevation or soil type? Or what if it looks like this? Now we're looking at introducing more variation in the block as a whole. So we have to think about how to make our sample reflect that. Then again, maybe we're not actually going to harvest the whole block together because let's say it ripens differently. Maybe we know, for example, that the green and the yellow sections are going to be harvested and fermented together. And the red and orange sections are also going to be harvested and fermented together, then if that's the case, we probably want to sample them separately so we can see how the fruit is ripening in those specific areas. If we sample everything together, we won't be able to see the difference between those areas. So once you define each of your sampling areas, then you have to decide what your sample size should be. And that's where variation comes into play. You may be aware that grapes are highly variable in their chemical and physical characteristics, not just across the vineyard, but even within an individual cluster. The number of samples that you need to collect in order to accurately estimate the value of a given parameter, like bricks for example, for the area you've selected depends on how much variability there is in that area. This is true of sampling anything with a physical distribution across space. To help visualize this, we can look at this rectangle with a distribution of three shapes, black dots, red triangles, and blue squares. Those shapes could represent anything. You can see that in some areas within the big rectangle, like here at the top left, there is very little variability. There's just evenly spaced black dots. In other areas, you also have things like very densely packed red triangles, which also show very little variability. Then we also have areas of higher var variability, like the bottom right, where there's a jumble of all three. But none of those areas by itself 
is representative of the rectangle as a whole. So if we sampled from any one of those areas alone, we would not get the whole picture. We'd have to take a larger sample. In a situation like this, if we know that the different areas are very different than each other, it might make sense to break them up and sample them separately so we can get a more detailed picture of the real distribution. So how do we figure out variability in the vineyard and then how do we use it to determine our sampling strategy? We have to use statistics and all statistics is based on probability. In this case, we're looking at the probability that the samples we collect will be an accurate representation of the sampled area as a whole. So if we talk about the vineyard, we might say the average bricks of the grapes in this vineyard block is 20 degrees bricks. In that case, it doesn't mean that every single grape is exactly 20 degrees bricks, but rather that some are higher than that and some are lower than that. In the statistics that we're going to use today, we assume that there are more grapes that fall near the average and fewer grapes that are on the very high or very low end of the distribution. So we represent that as a bell curve or a normal distribution. The middle point represents the average value of the thing you're measuring and the height of the curve represents how many individual measurements we assume will fall at each value within the entire range. So lots of measurements fall in the middle and very few measurements fall at the extreme ends. In a normal distribution, approximately 68% of the measurements fall within one standard deviation of the mean. So if you look at minus one standard deviation to plus one standard deviation and you add up 15% plus 19.1% plus 19.1%, plus 15%, you get 68.2%. On the bottom line of this figure, the cumulative percent is shown, meaning that as we move to the right, we cover more and more of this curve, adding up the percent of measurements that would be included as we go. If we want to be able to include, let's say, 90% of the individual measurements represented, we have to keep going up the scale of chunks or standard deviations until we get to about 1.6 or 1.7. And that becomes our z-score associated with covering 90% of the values in this distribution. When we talk about covering a certain percentage of the values, we can also refer to this as a confidence interval. A confidence interval is defined as a range of values that meets a specified probability that tr the true mean will fall within that range. So for example, a 95% confidence interval would mean that there is a 95% probability that the true population mean lies within that interval. And we get to choose the level of our confidence inter interval based on how confident we want to be in our data. The way we choose that level is by setting a z-score. If we remember on that bell curve diagram, the z-score represents the number of standard deviations away from the middle point of the curve or the mean. The higher the z-score, the higher percentage of the distributed values will cover and the higher our confidence level. So there are full z-tables that you can use, but often most people will just be interested in a specific confidence level. Here are some commonly used ones. For a 90% confidence interval, the z-score is 
for 95%, it is 1.960. For 98%, it is 2.326. And for 99%, it is 2.576. Now we know our desired z-score based on how confident we want to be. So what do we do with it? We use it to find our sample size, which was the point all along. And now we have to bring this all back to the amount of variation within the area that we're sampling. So the equation for that looks like required sample size equals the z-score times the standard deviation all over the margin of error all squared. The margin of error is one thing we haven't talked about, but it's exactly what it sounds like. It represents the acceptable plus or minus, meaning you want to be within, say, plus or minus half a degree bricks of the true average value for the areas we're sampling. It's not the same thing as the confidence level, which is a percentage based on probability. It's a simple offset or error value. And all of that will make a lot more sense if we look, in it, if we look at an example. Let's say we want to figure out the average cluster weight for the vineyard block. We don't actually know how much variation there is or how many samples we have to take, but Let's say we went out and grabbed 20 clusters. We weighed each of them and we saved ourselves a little bit of a headache by plugging them into a spreadsheet to get our mean and our standard deviation. Using these values, we get a mean of 67.45 grams and we get a standard deviation of 16.34. You can do that longhand, but I don't recommend it. So now we plug those numbers into our equation. That makes our required sample size equal to 1.645, which is our z-score, times 16.34, which is our standard deviation based on the samples we collected, over the margin of error, all squared. I decided my margin of error was plus or minus five grams for my average cluster weight. If we do that calculation, we get a required sample size of 28.9. Since we've already collected 20 samples and presumably we did a good job of representative sampling in terms of unbiased collection, cluster position, sunlight exposure, and all of those things, then we just need another nine clusters using the same good sampling protocol. And then we'll have met the parameters we set for ourselves in terms of our confidence interval and our margin of error based on the level of variability that we saw in the cluster weights. But let's look at what would happen if we wanted a higher confidence interval of 95% instead of 90%, which would make our z-score 1.960 instead of 1.645. And maybe our margin of error is tighter too, so we only want to allow an error of plus or minus two grams for our average cluster weight. If we do that calculation, now we need 256.4 cluster samples. You can also see that if we had more variation in our initial sample weights, that would make our standard deviation higher. And, and a higher standard deviation would mean we needed a larger sample size to capture that variability. One more quick example. This time we're looking at bricks. Like last time, we don't actually know the variability in the area we're sampling we don't know how many samples we need to collect, but let's say we started with 20. Using the BRICS value for each sample, we can calculate our mean and standard deviation. In this case, we get a mean of 21.96 degrees BRICS, 
and a standard deviation of 2.24. So if we plug that into our equation, we'll stick with a z-score of 1.645, representing a 90% confidence interval, times the standard deviation, which was 2.24, over the margin of error, and let's say we're okay with an error of plus or minus 0 0.5 bricks, and then we square all of that. So if we do that calculation, we get a required sample size of 54.3, meaning we have to collect another 35 samples in order to capture the variation based on the values we got for those first 20 samples. And just like in the previous example, if we want a higher confidence interval or a lower margin of error, or if there's more variability across the values, that required sample size will go up. So before we finish up, you may be wondering how to go about choosing your confidence interval and your margin of error. And I like to approach this basically from um, three uh, three considerations. Um, and the first one is just practicality. So in that earlier example where we were looking at uh, cluster sampling for cluster weights, um, we plugged in our numbers when we had a really high confidence interval and a really low margin of error, and we calculated that we needed a sample size of 256 clusters, um, which seems really excessive. Not only does that not sound like a lot of fun, um, it's probably not a great use of your time when you have a whole bunch of um, other things to do. So if you, um, if you do that calculation and you plug it in and you get something really excessive like 256 clusters, um, that's time to say, okay, maybe we can be a little bit more reasonable. Maybe our confidence interval doesn't need to be quite as high. It doesn't need to be 98%, maybe 95% is acceptable. Um, and you can get it into a more manageable range. Another uh, point to consider when you're looking at um, setting your confidence interval and your margin of error is um, really just convention when it comes to um, collecting data. So, um, 95% confidence interval and 98% confidence interval are really, um, they're typical. They're very generally accepted as good levels for meaningful data. Um, and so when it comes to setting your confidence interval, I really wouldn't recommend going any higher or any lower. Um, that 95%, 98% range is really, um, what I would suggest sticking to. Um, if you find that you plug in 95% confidence interval and you're ending up with these excessive um, sample sizes that are required, um, that probably indicates that you have a large amount of variation in that sample area. And at that point, you really should be considering breaking it down um, into less variable areas. So you probably have sections that are drastically different from each other and you um, can do sub, you know, sampling of those subsections instead. Um, and that'll bring it hopefully into a more reasonable range. And then I would say the last thing to consider really is um, what is going to give you useful information, right? So um, if you're doing something like cluster sampling for cluster weights, um, probably you're going to use that information for things like yield estimates, right? Um, which in turn can be used for things like um, how much tank space am I going to need? Um, how much uh, supplies ordering do I need to do? Um, things like that. So that margin of error you would want to base on um, how much tolerance you have in your process, right? So um, how dialed in does it need to be in order to not accidentally run out of tank space or not accidentally run out of cellar chemicals or whatever? Um, or alternatively, okay, let's go back to we're sampling for, for bricks. We want to measure bricks um, on our samples. And that information can be used for a couple of things. One would be potential alcohol. Um, and so you would want to set your margin of error based on how much tolerance you have there. If it's really important to you to have that 
alcohol super dialed in, um, you would want to have a low margin of error. If, it, if you don't really care that much about what your potential alcohol is gonna be, maybe you go ahead and set a really high margin of error because you don't particularly care. Um, or alternatively, if you're measuring bricks for um, ripeness tracking, um, you know, and you're measuring bricks, let's say, from week to week, and you're monitoring the change over time, um, maybe a change of one bricks doesn't mean that much for you in terms of potential alcohol, but maybe, you know, you want to avoid false trends in your data. So you don't want to see what looks like a jump of one degree bricks when in fact that's not actually what's happening out in the vineyard. And so that's a false trend um, and you don't want that kind of variation or that, that kind of fluctuation um, in your data from one data point to another. So these are the kinds of things to, um, to consider when you are trying to set your confidence interval and your margin of error. Um, a lot of it is gonna be sort of uh, trial and error in terms of what works best for your planning and your process. Um, but the examples that I showed earlier in the, in the video were based on um, hopefully what I think are, are good ballpark, um, reasonable, numbers to use for those values given the examples that we were working with. So for cluster weights, you know, set the mar margin of error at um, plus or minus five grams. I think that's reasonable um, and so on. But if you have any questions, um, do feel free to reach out to us and um, happy statistics. Thanks for watching this wine math video. If you have any questions regarding the math or the general wine topic covered, feel free to reach out to us at wine at iastate.edu. Check out the other wine math videos to improve your math skills in the cellar. Cheers.